thank you, Peter, very much. You do your job very well. You made this so easy for all of us. And I want to thank Joanne for asking me to participate in this panel tonight. It's, it's really exciting to see your work here, and I feel honored to be a part of this evening. As moderator, I want to tell you what's going to happen tonight. I'm going to briefly introduce Joanne, who will talk to us about her work, and then Kathy and I will each take about five minutes to uh, talk to you about why we're here. And um, after that, the three of us will have a conversation about Joanne's work. We'll grill her, and then you'll get a chance to do that. Uh, now, we're going to be very kind to Joanne. Joanne Callis has been my dear friend since we met in 1987. I think I can tell you some of the unique things I love about her in just a couple of sentences. First of all, I never knew she was in the 1981 Whitney Biennial until I read her, her bio a couple of weeks ago. So Joanne doesn't tell, uh, tell us everything. She's a little bit modest. But then sort of her, some of her personality means that sometimes she tells us more than we want to know. <laughs> um, but it's OK. Her creative artist's nature doesn't have so much discernment, though, about the difference between what we want to know and what we don't want to know. But that's lucky for all of us, because being predictable is boring. And Joanne will never bore you, not with her pictures and not with her words. There's always something really fabulous going on inside her head. She's interesting. She's curious, kind, caring really smart and talented, loyal, loving, and fun. That's who I know Joanne to be. From childhood, Joanne became fascinated with interiors and furniture, probably because her dad owned a furniture store and her mom often, her school teacher mom often redecorated their home. And because her art teacher said her pictures were good, she felt not only encouraged but sure that she wanted to be an artist when she grew up. Later, studying with the brilliantly inventive photographer and teacher Robert Heineken, she found her medium. She got a late start, already the mother of Stephen and Michael, but she charged out of the starting gate, having important exhibitions very, in the very early years. I appreciate Judith Keller's inclusion in her essay, a quote from Suzanne Muchnick's 1982 LA Times article describing Callis as an artist who makes viewers squirm by affecting an atmosphere of exquisite torture, using such innocuous instruments as floor lamps, flashlights, satiny fabrics, and wet bodies. It's not boring, is it? And besides, how many artists choose gray frames? But they really work. So Joanne's a really good artist. After Joanne began setting up pictures and making her exciting color prints, many others followed. She was doing what she had to do, and it caused a shift in the very definition of photography. I call Joanne the queen of provocative. Joanne's photographs are psychological and seductive. They reveal an artist taking pleasure in looking at something that originated in her brain. Then the pleasure becomes ours. So it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you, Joanne, to show us and share your work with us. Well, I've been thinking about this for a year and a half. It's finally here. Um, <laughs> of course, uh, there's a couple people I need to thank. And um, Judy Keller, who couldn't be with us tonight, she's traveling, but it was her idea to have this show for me. And um, it's her keen eye and her insights and her consummate professionalism that made it so much fun and a, a pleasure to go through this process with her. And then, of course, Gay Block, who is my dear friend and who's been a generous supporter. And without her generosity, none of this would have happened. And um, of course, Kathy Opie uh, for graciously accepting the invitation and uh, to speak tonight. And I chose these two women because they are fascinating to listen to. I love having them around me. And I think you will, too. 
And then I'm just going to run off this list because these are the people. I worked with Catherine Lorenz and Suzanne Watson in publishing with, with the book uh, experience, and Susan DeLand, Davina Walter, Ann Martins, Paco Link, and Amy Davis, and of course, Peter, who did make this a very easy process for tonight. So now I'll just talk a little bit about um, the themes running through my work. Um, I seem to keep changing, and it, it looks on, from the outside like I keep changing my mind about what I'm doing, but there's certain threads that go through all of it because it's coming from me, and that's consistent. And one of them is anxiety and tension. <laughs> Who knew, right? And sort of taking pleasure in the strangeness of the, or, um, the ordinariness, the strangeness in everyday objects and situations and how things can be going on simultaneously so that what appears to be normal in one part of your head or your life, uh, then there's all this other stuff that's going on that may not be so ordinary. And also beauty or my idea of beauty and aesthetics and always uh, some kind of attention paid to the tactile quality of things. And um, sometimes there's humor. And um, mostly the pictures are psychologically charged, at least for the first um, 20 years of my taking pictures. 15, maybe. OK. Um, I've always wanted to please myself and uh, make work that interested me. And so if something interested me, I didn't think too much about how is this going to go with my other body of work. I just wanted to follow my own nose. And at being a fine art photographer, I didn't have to please anyone but myself. And in fact, when I get stuck and don't know what to do next, I kind of think, well, what would I take pleasure in looking at? Or what would be fun to work on? Or mostly it's, it's those kinds of things that I think about. And then I get over being stuck. Um, so there's certain things that go through um, my work that you'll see. And I'm going to start with the first slide. And as I mentioned, um, and it, this is not all the bodies of work. And certainly this show is just a survey. And so um, it's not everything I've done for, by any means. And this is called. Um, salt, pepper, and fire. And I was thinking, I, I know some of you heard me talk about this at a walkthrough the other day, but I'm going to repeat it. Uh, this is um, the, the things you ordinarily see on a table, perhaps in a restaurant where they have the spotlight up above and it looks all beautiful. And then there's this other kind of a thing going on, the surreal thing going on, or the other part of your life that's kind of out of control. And then there's this fire going on on the table and a bird flying out of it. And so uh, surrealism is an interest of mine in that way of putting disparate things together so that um, they coexist and they look right, you see. They look right together, but they don't make quite sense. And um, these are somewhat chron chronological. So um, this was um, done because I, I knew I was interested in still life and objects. And I wanted to look at each one individually rather than put them in a still life arrangement so that each one almost has equal weight to the others. And so I built up a scene, um, like a, a bedroom scene, and just with the objects that were in hand, and let the viewer put them together. And then some of those pictures that are in these, I call them grids, or not exactly, but um, are there because they, um, they have a similar shape or something. I, I would think about one object, and then that would lead me to thinking about other objects. And it was like kind of free association. And this one, uh, called Performance, is about tonight <laughs> and many other times that everyone's always performing. And we all are called upon to do that. So um, I asked a model who was young and made it look easy. And she, I just asked her to do this repeatedly, because you have to keep doing them over and over. And um, so it's, it's about performing and making it look easy. And so there's this theatrical curtain idea of, that I'm always interested in seemingly to do, like to make a stage, to make my own world, and 
occupy it in the way I want to. So the pictures are never made to, you, you're not ever made to think that um, they're offhand or I just caught it on the fly. I mean, they always look like they're staged and that's on purpose, theatrical. And this is called Dish Trick, you know, trying to pull the tablecloth out um, and not have the dishes break. And so for me, this was like having the rug pulled out from under you. Uh, those times in your life when things are very unpredictable and you can't control them and it looks like it's all just going to fall down on your floor. And so that's what this was about. And um, this is called uh, Three Tears. So um, I was thinking of the still lives or the sculpture and paintings, how fabric is used. And I've always loved using fabric. I've often used it as backdrops or um, in the photograph some other way. But fabric is so expressive and it has movement and it has texture. And um, I wanted to just sort of isolate making things out of fabric that suggested sometimes it's movement and sometimes as in this one it isn't. But I thought about my love of desserts and so I thought I could make a cake out of fabric. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And it's of course, it's in the center and it's center stage and there's a spotlight behind it. And so it's, it looks special because of the lighting. And then this was um, the combination of 15 different desserts. Um, it's called Forbidden Pleasures. And it's, I was thinking about how, um, well, first of all, I love desserts. And <laughs> I thought this would give me great pleasure to go out and buy them and not feel guilty about it, because I knew I wasn't going to eat these. <laughs> so. I did just that. I went all over LA finding the right dessert and that had the right drip or the right cherry or whatever it was on top and um, put them together. It, but I didn't put them on plates. And so it, that was because I didn't want you to actually think that you were going to eat these desserts um, like any ordinary dessert. So it made it kind of special. And they become little sculptures or little jewels in themselves. And so it's, it made me think about looking at them in a more abstract way. And also the, the terminology, the words used like, oh, I shouldn't have eaten that, I feel so guilty, or I cheated, or um, I wish I hadn't, you know, I'll do better tomorrow. <laughs> All that kind of language is like this guilt about, so there's some s similarity between uh, sex and desserts, <laughs> which, <laughs> I'm sure you all know about, right? <laughs> and so, um, well, there's a lot in here that I didn't, but the next slide is um, this baby. I photographed um, baby heads. Uh, I, found, uh, I found these babies, sometimes they were friends of people I knew, and sometimes I just met them in a, like in a department store um, with their mothers. <laughs> and. I got permission to, you know, to photograph them, and because I thought that um, we project so much onto, um, to oh, I forgot to say something before. Okay, we project so much onto a baby, like what will this baby become, and what's its future hold, and the great promise that's there, and. Um, and yet, when you really scrutinize the baby, I mean, usually it's so filled with love, if, especially if it's related to you or close to you in some way. And um, they're so strange looking, because we keep comparing them to a, an adult's proportions. And of course, it's not. And so the large head, the lack of a neck, um, <laughs> And small body, and but I was looking for that that kind of knowing look, that kind of um, wise look, or something uh, in the face that attracted me that way. And so I don't really think of them as portraits in any way of the child, um, whatever that could mean at the small baby, but uh, more just how, let's just scrutinize this. And I, I 
you know, they're larger than life size. They're not huge prints, but I also did some paintings of babies, which were quite big. And so the scale has something to do with the impact of that. Um, the, uh, let's see. Uh, this is a group of pictures. This I call it Hubba Hubba Girls. Um, I appropriated um, the images of Max Tatch, uh, who photographed homes in the valley and uh, in the 60s, 50s, and 60s. And uh, when I moved to California, it was in 61, and um, I, I, there were a lot of ranch homes, and so looking at these pictures was just like memory memory lane for me, and I was just very attracted to them. And it's not so much that I think the interiors are beautiful, but that they're very familiar. In fact, some of them are not very beautiful in my view at all, but I love them because they're just so great in the way that style was. And I, it's just like looking at old styles. You know, if you look at your high school yearbook, it's, you think, I couldn't believe I wore that or something. Well, same with furnishings. And so, but this one, um, and I found these designs, uh, either made them up or found them in books and altered them so that those lay over them almost as comments on those rooms. And I think there's some slides, uh, there are some images missing of the baby painting and some others, but I, maybe we just don't have them. Is that right? Okay. So uh, I think Kathy, um, well, Gay, are you going to speak next or? Okay. Are you done? No, no. We're going to have a conversation um, <laughs> afterwards. They're going to show you what they're doing. You and you forgot to say something. What did you forget oh. to say? Well, in the animal food pictures, the first picture, um, those pictures were either of animals or food, and so, or both. And so the bird in there, I explained about that, but um, the food seems to go through a lot of my work too, so I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with it. Love it. <laughs> okay. Nothing earth shaking. Okay. We'll, we'll ask you more questions. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> okay. I met Catherine Opie at the same time I met Joanne, which was when I taught at Cal Arts for one semester in 1987. Kathy was a student in both Joanne's and my classes. Good teachers, weren't we? Well, that's really a joke, because at least where I'm concerned, because uh, by then Kathy was well on her way. She was, uh, this was her last year of grad school, and um, she was working on a fascinating project of um, spec houses being built in Valencia, um, at least that last semester. Now, 20 plus years later, I've attended some of her exhibits, and including her exquisite mid-career retrospective at the Guggenheim in New York in September. Um, Kathy works hard. She works all the time, and her work is beautiful. I think John Sarkowski would have said, true and just. The three of us met last Sunday to discuss this evening, and later that day I wrote in an email to a friend. Kathy is a spectacular person, very free and calm, deeply intelligent, with rampant ideas exciting curiosity, and real warmth. It's my honor to introduce Catherine Opie. OK, gay block got me to cry. That's pretty good. Um, yeah, they, they were. They were my teachers. And that's why I'm so glad, actually, to be here. Because I, I remember first coming to uh, recognizing Joanne's work when I was actually an intern at Camera Work in San Francisco. And the Gallery Min book had just been published. And uh, I would go through, and I have that book still to, to this day in my library. And I would go through it. And at that point in time, I had graduated from San Francisco Art Institute. And I had applied to Chicago. 
Art Institute, Yale, and CalArts for grad schools, and uh, almost didn't even get into CalArts, actually. I was on the waiting list, but fortunately, after three interviews, they decided to let me in. And uh, I had the pleasure of being in Gay's uh, portrait class and being Joanne's TA. And Joanne would hear all these stories, and I would I think I would f fluster her a bit, uh, because I would come back from San Francisco after attending some, like, incredible leather club or had some girlfriend that I met or something like that and I would like end up telling Joanne these stories where she would fidget but as Gay said with you know very much curiosity going well then what happened you know so um, so it's it's really amazing to be able to come back to this work in a certain way and I'm going backwards so I'll go forwards and and think about it really in kind of relationship to my own work and not that um, not in a way in 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 which that uh, I look at it specifically as in terms of being in inspired by it in making decisions within my own work but what holds us within photography what within those histories do we begin to look at what becomes intuitive the fact is is that Joanne was making this kind of work before anybody really was making it. And so when I, when she asked me back in uh, the fall to, to do this with her and Gay, I, I of course said, of course. And then I started looking at the work again. And I came to this image because in, the, in a way this image really, I, I, I remember at the same time that I was looking at this image when I was a young little baby dyke in San Francisco, I was also looking at Maplethorpe's ex-portfolio. So there was this like really interesting conversation about the body, but it was really important for me that this was, was a woman making this work. And I think that that is something that is important in relationship to the work when you think about it, about desire, about femininity, about domesticity, and about how of all those things become encompassed in, the, in, in this like very psychological play in relationship to how she created and constructed images. And so then we get to 1993 of a, my self-portrait, self-portrait cutting. And uh, with a, in, in a way, this drip is coming down in the same way that Joe Joanne had this, you know, shampoo coming down about this back and about ideas of identity in relationship to just being read not from the face, not being a portrait. And I think it's very important to understand Joanne's work um, in relate, and this is what I hope we talk about a little bit tonight in, a, in our conversation, of how we relate to it in terms of non-portraiture to a certain extent. Um, this portrait for me, though, was a very political portrait. It was a very much a move that I had to make in relationship to ideas of queer identity and a lesbian identity, specifically of my longing for domesticity. Of uh, this happened after a two-year relationship broke up. I think actually I had I was also Gay's assistant for a time period, and I think this relationship might have been in the process of breaking up while I was assisting Gay, or just happened right before then. Um, and then uh, there's this image of Joanne's, which is just this very uh, curious uh, movement from hairline down the back. Uh, again, uh, very provocative of the woman's face against the fabric, um, how incredibly uh, sexual to a certain extent it is, but the identity hidden to a certain extent, except for still being read as female and the importance of that. And then we have my portrait of my friend Steak who tattooed Dyke on the back of her neck. So using ink and line in a different way, again, in relationship to one's identity and one's sexual identity. Then we have, this is, this is one of the most interesting portraits to me because one of the things that Joanne does with the work is it's just titled Man. 
but this is a man with these like very bright lips in a certain way and so you don't really know if you should read it as man or as female and I find it incredibly androgynous photographs so like when you're like you know this young lesbian and you're used to all of these kind of butches who play with uh, with ideas of sexuality and femininity the, you know this automatically became something that I would go back to and look at and think about in relationship to those identities that we constructed within our community, our own community, which was so curious to me in relationship to a wider notion of a heterosexual co construct in which what Joanne was, was doing and playing with. And then this one, I always think about Jeff Wall's uh, kind of uh, uh, after Delacroix in a certain way, and but this is like even before Jeff Wall made that image. And just the mirror down and the, the way that the shadow works and the light and everything is just, it's such an odd photograph to me. It's like one of these photographs that you kind of can't keep looking at and wondering about in terms of, you know, how am I supposed to really deal with this? Am I supposed to think about masculinity? Or am I supposed to think about the construction of it being falling apart? That, or narcissism, the rolled up carpet, like the, is there a dead body in there? There's like, one of the things that I love about Joanne's images is they're incredibly sculptural and they leave you with not only uh, lust, but a lot of desire too. Uh, then uh, with with the photograph of thinking about um, the man with the tie is uh, my photograph of Justin Bond, uh, who's an amazing drag performer uh, who used to live in San Francisco and is now in um, New York. He actually played Carnegie Hall a few years ago. He's an incredible performer. And then I have Joanne's performance. And I have had a long, long relationship with uh, performance artist Ron Athey. And I was asked back in 2000 to make a body of work for him for the AIDS Alliance. And um, using the curtains, using the stage, what it is in relationship to being a performance artist. And this was done with the largest Polaroid camera ever made and uh, called the Moby. And it's, uh, it's 10 feet high by 43 inches wide in terms of a unique Polaroid. And I worked for two days in the studio making a total of about 14 to 15 images. And then there's always my desire for domesticity. It's, um, it, I have to say that from the uh, cutting on the back to even me traveling around the country in an RV photographing lesbian domestic settings across the United States for three and a half months, that I have finally reached that place of complete domestic bliss in my own life with uh, a wonderful partner and uh, two kids and three dogs, a cat, a turtle, and uh, five chickens. <laughs> And so within this domestic bliss, before the domestic bliss, there was trying to figure out the domestic bliss. And I think that that's something in relationship to Joanne's work that she looks at. But it's really curious to me because at the, I, 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 this is a question we'll, we'll talk about it in terms of uh, when we get, all get on stage. But at the time period, she left Ohio, moved here. In terms of women and photographers, they mainly went to their families to make images. And Joanne did everything against that in a certain way, where it's like, here I am wanting to discover like lesbian domesticity and bliss by buying this RV and traveling for three and a half months. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to show a few of this. This is Tammy Ray Carlin and her girlfriend, Kaya, and Miggy and Eileen here in Los Angeles. And then I'm going to leave it on a very much a documentary photograph, but it's as close to Joanne as I could possibly ever come uh, stylistically. And this is a lesbian cocktail party. And, um, but none of my photographs, I mean, it's very interesting because I think this will be a part of the conversation that hopefully you guys will flesh out as an audience tonight as well, um, that 
I have always come to photography from very much of a documentary position. Gay comes from a documentary position as well and moves in and out of those ideas in relationship to portraiture. Um, Joanne constructs her images. And I also construct my images, but always within the idea of document. So I think within those, there's a lot of things to discuss that are very interesting that I hope that will um, uh, bring to you. But tonight, now, uh, Gay is going to come up and finish up. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kathy and Joanne. Well, now, what exactly am I doing here besides introducing? Well, I brought a, brought a few images to try to answer that question. I started making appointments to set up my camera in front of someone who I needed to photograph, people about whom I felt anger and intolerance, my family and my community that I needed to deal with and understand. So I certainly, yes, Kathy did deal with my family. Um, this was what was going on inside of my head in 1973 when I began photographing. Anger at my mother and her friends for what I saw as questionable values. I needed to put them on film so I could see them and remember them. Um, what I didn't expect is that I would learn from them after I saw the images that I had made. And this is why I fell in love with photography, because it wasn't just going and t taking the picture and talking to the people, but it was seeing the picture I'd made, and I thought, huh, how did, where, where did that come from? And um, so it really taught me a lot. I didn't do the seminal work that Joanne did of inventing a whole new form of photography, but my motivation was similar. I was looking for subjects who could make me calmer. Uh, that is my mother. So, um, in 1976. And um, that's sort of what I felt was the iconic um, uh, statement about my mother and me. I didn't have a sister, I had a brother, but he was, you know, uh, a big guy, you know, sort of a larger than life person. But I felt like the overweight uh, daughter with the very stylish, you know, everything that's important is what I look like, mother. Um, and then I went to, uh, I'm skipping around a little bit, but I, 10 years later I went to South Beach in Miami and I found love and like the grandparents I wished I'd had. And um, yeah, they did want to protect their noses. <laughs> And, oh, they were just fabulous. I mean, you could just see how you could fall in love with people on South Beach in Miami, which, of course, South Beach in Miami is like a different world today. But this was the early 80s. And so then when I was uh, doing pictures, I, I, I they later produced a book uh, about my mother. I photographed my mother from the time I started photographing in 73 until she died in 91. And I never really exhibited the pictures because they all looked angry to me. Um, about a year after she died, those same pictures didn't look angry anymore because I guess I had come to miss her. And so I knew I was going to deal with the pictures after she died. It was not that she didn't see the pictures and that she didn't pose for pictures and didn't, it, it was all collaborative in a way, but um, I just didn't like printing the pictures. So after she died, I started not only dealing with the pictures I had made, but making new ones with the things I had. And this was, uh, of course, the first that I ended up with. And. Um, there was a, a bracelet my father had given my mother that said, I love you in diamonds on these little gold blocks. And um, as I showed you in the slide of the mother and two daughters, the overweight problem is a sub-theme that's gone through my work. And um, then, of course, Joanne had, I don't know if you had done your desserts. Yeah, you had done your desserts by then, for sure. And uh, But um, as you can see, when it got to number eight there, I did eat the cake. and mess around with the cake and all we have left now is the bracelet. 
And that's the, my mother's jewelry that I was left with, um, all in eight by 10 photography paper boxes. Just had to figure out something to do with it. And so besides keeping it in the safe deposit box, I photographed it. And then just general portraits have, have always just been my passion. And one day I was rounding the corner uh, to my house and this girl was standing by the car at, at this place called the, called the Tsuki Market. I live in Santa Fe. And uh, I ran home. I mean, I continued to go home, got my camera, came back, and she was still there with the family. And I, started, I took a few pictures. I talked to the family and got permission. And then I said to her, would you please uh, stand, uh, lean on the car. When I first saw you, you were leaning against the car. And she took the exact same pose I had seen her in. And it, I just love the way people do their, their thing, where the way they just are who they are. And that's all I've always loved showing, is just who people are. Um, and then in uh, 1981, I did some pictures at a girls' summer camp that I had actually gone to in the 50s. And then 25 years later, I went and found the women and to find out what they were really like, because that was what I always intended to find out in the first place in 1981, but I never talked to them in 1981, because I was so, I fell so in love with what they looked like that, um, I'm only going to show you two of those that I didn't didn't have conversations with them, but then I did later on. So these are diptychs of oh, I thought there were two of those, but maybe it didn't happen. Okay. Um, so this is the um, <laughs> a self portrait of me with one of my mother's furs in the first two images. And anyway, that shows you the amount of time. It took me to do the book about my mother, uh, which was 10 years, which was an unconscionable amount of time. But anyway, I think that's all I'm going to show you. <clears throat> and then we are going to um, stand up here and talk. Are we on? Yes, we're on. Okay. The other day when uh, Kathy and Joanne and I <coughs> had <coughs> lunches on Sunday, uh, we were sitting at the table and every once in a while, ne none of us was looking at, the, at each other. We were all looking around <coughs> at, because that's what we do as photographers. We look at, and, and Kathy said she always uh, said that what photography allows us to do is the prolonged stare. <laughs> so the house lights aren't quite, they're not quite close enough and the house no, lights no, aren't no. up quite enough for us to do that right I know, this minute. But there, there, there's a few prolonged stares to have out there, so. <laughs> um, so welcome, Joanne. Thank you. Aren't they great? I feel like I'm Merv Griffin or something. I don't think I've ever really done this. <laughs> See, that dates me back to you know a certain time period. Um, I guess I guess something that I I was thinking of in terms of one of the things that I brought up in relationship to talking about your work a moment ago is how sculptural they are, and I was wondering if you could talk about that in a certain way at the time period that you were making work, it was still a very photographer's photographer place in relationship to ideas of image making. And, you know, what, what was that first, like, you know, impetus, uh, so to speak, to just kind of break through that? Was it studying with Heineken and the looseness of UCLA to a certain extent? Or what, what was that, that you didn't follow the trajectory of so many, what, Gay and I kind of followed in a certain way, which was like right out of the Zarkowski school. So could you talk a little bit about that? I had been interested in sculpture. And so um, before I ever learned to use the camera, I, I didn't 
learn about the camera until I was 33. So um, before that, I was doing collages, uh, tried to paint unsuccessfully, and sculpture was really my love. But you needed a big studio for that, and I really didn't have the facility. And so anyway, when photography came along, I just thought, this is so great because you can get at what you want to, and it's pretty quick. <laughs> and sculpture takes forever. So um, I always just had that feeling for it, I think. And of course, with Heineken, there were never assignments. So we got to do whatever we wanted from the very beginning. And I really appreciated that. And I thought, well, what can I do that would be m me? And I just thought, just look inside of what's going on and try to bring that out. Because you know, we're all the same, but we're all different as well. So I thought, that's the way you can just be more true to yourself. And of course, you end up being influenced by everybody all the time. but. Who, who would you say were your oh, biggest influences? <laughs> no, I get to do this now. You brought it up. No, at that time. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Heineken was showing me Pierre Molinier. Uh -huh. And um, yes, Pierre Molinier and um, Hans Belmer and, oh gosh, Dwayne Michaels at that time. Uh, and what you was know. your first reaction to that work? Do you remember? Was it titillating, curious? Like, how would you kind of name it and I've, describe it? I guess I thought it was, um, they were pretty brave and that you were able to do that and it was okay. And it was, it was kind of fascinating. I was a voyeur and I, I, um, I, I also think it was at a time when I was extremely fearful because I didn't really know how I was going to make a living. I knew I was going to be divorced. I had two children. And I was just really nervous about how to be an artist and have all that and juggle all that, those things in the air. And so uh, I just made work that uh, talked about um, the, the anxiety of that and the but the beauty of it and of, of how things look, and I don't know, it, that's mm -hmm. how it evolved. No, no, yeah. thanks. Okay. Okay, you have anything you want to add? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, jump on in here. Well, I, what I want to say is that I love your pictures so much, and they're, they're, they have such a quality of mystery, and, um, you know, you look at them and you just want to, continue to look and try to figure it out. And uh, I love that you love painting. And I miss your photographs. I want you to keep photographing just because mm -hmm. you make more photographs than you make paintings because mm -hmm. obviously, as you said, it's quicker. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's just a, this exciting element to your photographs. Thank you. Yes, I, I miss it too sometimes. Um, and you never know. You, you never know. know. All right. <laughs> no, no thoughts percolating up there about but it is stops true and that shutter speeds. No, and not, not about that. I never. <laughs> when I have Nicole as my assistant, I will go back to making photographs. <laughs> but oh. we do. Do we do have to make work that is? We are the audience. That's right. Each what would you like to audience. see right now up on your wall, exactly. or in front of you in some way? So, so let's like do a flashback. You have this show up here. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's been a long time, probably to a certain extent, even though planning for the show, you looked at the work for a bit. How did you come about some of the decisions in terms of what to put in? What did you, what do you think about now looking back at that work that uh, from the 70s and 80s even? When I first started to look back, I, s I felt a little embarrassed, to tell you the truth, because I'm in a different place now. And that work goes back to 73, um, some of the early black and white work. And I thought, oh my god, I would never make that work now. But I'm a very different person now than I was then. So I came to be more comfortable just thinking, give yourself a break. And you know that's where you were. And, and it felt good. Like, making scary pictures that were beautiful at first felt extremely um, comforting because I could get at the way I was feeling in a way. And I think it's always a comfort to know that you're connecting with other people 
in some level, like you're understood. There's some part of you that you can communicate without words, but it's just, it's like when you read a book and you just feel that author has said it the way you would have liked to have said it. Well, that kind of recognition. So that gave me a lot of pleasure. And for me, I never wanted to be overt, although it's, some of them are much more overt than others, but with the, the sexuality, or, or I just wanted to have innuendo and, and suggest it without anything really happening. Right, so they're not they're not graphic, but yet they are graphic. Yes, it's a, it's it's, it's a that funny line. Comment. It's the line. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Well, you had a, a retrospective at the um, Center for Creative Photography in Tucson that I saw, and obviously it was a bigger show than this, and right. much more of a of a complete survey. And I didn't really know your early work so well before that, and I was just astounded at the continuum at the how the, they all it all related it was so, so obvious that it, everything was done by the same photographer oh, and yeah. um, and those early pictures are really valid in my mind um, oh, in terms of in, in terms of what you were doing then as well as in terms of your work as it pro progressed you know, to answer your first question, Judy Keller actually curated the show, and she chose the work pretty much. Oh, okay. And even if, when I said, well, uh, that's not maybe my favorite one, but it didn't matter, it got in there anyway. Uh -huh. So she was really directing it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm grateful. It sort of took some of that responsibility off mm -hmm. of me. I mean, sometimes I was wondering about it, but so it was, yeah, she, it was she that did that. When we uh, had lunch the other day, we talked a little bit about how um, personal, usually, things are that are written about, photog about women photographers, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how often um, you'll find an introduction in a monograph or a book about a male photographer, and all that personal information probably won't be there, at least in the same way. And um, then I reflected on the uh, introductions that I wrote tonight. And just as my own work is, so, for, is personal, I made introductions that were very personal. And so um, I think that's the better way, personally. But I think that's a conversation. No, I mean, I think, you know, I commented on that at lunch because I, was, I read the forward to the catalog and I learned a lot from you, which I've known you for over 20 years now, and I, so I learned interesting things about you that I was actually really glad to learn about. I found it, these certain kind of curious um, moments where paths have crossed. You left Ohio in 1961. I was born in Ohio in 1961. That's uh, why I left. No. I know, no, no. I know, you left, exactly. That's why you left. Like, oh, something bad's happening in Sandusky. I better go. Uh, we both returned to childhood homes in Ohio and mm. looked at them. But so in, in a certain way, I was really happy to read such um, personal information about you. Um, but one of the things that's interesting is within that personal information, I actually don't think that it necessarily informs the work. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think the work comes out of this very different place that's not necessarily important for me to know about your divorce or certain <laughs> things like that. But and then, I, then that's what got me thinking like, oh, well, if this was a male photographer, this probably wouldn't have been written in the same way. They would really be addressing the work from a much more historical um, standpoint, which also was done in relationship to the essay. So it was just, I mean, you brought it up, but that was one mm -hmm. of the things what, which was curious to me, was just thinking about that, kind of how in a certain way your work is um, very much hyper femininity, you know, but it's, but, but I mean that in a way in which that, um, of how it's designed. You know, and but it's really, I mean, and then that's the curious thing is like when you look at Outer Bridge downstairs, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. also there's this like hyperness in relationship to those stage sets, but that was commercial work where yours was done for, you know, right. artistic. 
I think some reason. of the questions that were asked is, well, how did you happen to make this body of work, or what right. are these about? And it's usually what was what I was thinking about at the time, mm -hmm. what I got obsessed with, just want to explore that, or what I just need to make these pictures because they f it feels good to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's maybe why that's, uh, or maybe just. <clears throat> I don't know why. Well, I think we as women <laughs> are more women. personal anyway. I <laughs> mean, right. I think that it, it just it's comes through. To, yes. Well, of course, so. your work has got some autobiographical qualities for sure. Oh, very and much mine so. certainly does in, yes. its, no. in, in its origin. Um, and mine does too, only it's not It's not through the self-portrait. Exactly. It's all coming exactly. from that. It's, it's not you, an intellectual place. Have you ever done a self-portrait? Oh, at the beginning a little bit. Yeah. I haven't for, no, <laughs> years. <laughs> Would you do one for me, please? <laughs> sure. Self-portrait. <laughs> Self-portrait. Do one for her. <laughs> Self-portrait Joanne by That's Kathy. right. <laughs> and gay. They should both do one. That could be for a me. whole series of self-portraits. Right. See, just having other photographers do the self-portrait. That's a whole new, that's perfect that's in terms of idea. the idea of the constructed again. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I think that it's possible that you out, out there will have some questions yes. for Joanne, and I know she's ready for you. No. Right. Yes. Wait for microphone. Okay. Okay, here. We have somebody right here. Can you say something about your relationship to Other than I was hissed once. <laughs> <laughs> It, w it was not, but uh, of course I was affected by it, and it certainly raised my consciousness, and I could see where some of the pictures might be offensive to the feminists of the 70s, early 70s. Uh, the women's heads were not shown. Sometimes I wanted to obscure the identity because I didn't want them to be about a personality. I wanted it to be sort of stand for a woman. And, um, and, and there's a sort of alluded to and discomfort or I don't know things that I could understand but it was just coming from my own ideas of what that was and so maybe I wasn't as enlightened then maybe I was 33 or 34 years old with a very different time for me and also the times and so but I was never active in the movement but I was of course always for equality and, and all the things it stood for, but I was never political. And I was home with two children and with no help and no family and just taking care of what was at hand. Yeah. It's it's like a daydream of a Caribbean vacation, you know. <laughs> that's, that's, that's where a little humor got into the work. So the animal and food thing, and so um, yeah, it just seems like you drift back into that warm tub and just imagine, <laughs> yeah. So it's, that wasn't the tension and anxiety in <laughs> no, that no, picture. No, no, no. <laughs> that that was a wannabe somewhere. Yeah. I have a question. Um, the feminine is so ever-present in all three of your work. Um, and I enjoyed hearing each of you talk about your work in relation to Joanne's. But it's interesting how very distinctive the feminine appears if you look at each of your bodies of work. Um, but I'm struck by the fact that, uh, Joanne, when you were talking about um, the photographers who influenced you early on, it was Belmer, um, Molinier, Dwayne Michaels, Heineken, I, I imagine. Were there any female photographers or women that inspired your work? And I say that because it's kind of interesting, right. certainly hearing Kathy talk, how she did look at your work and you provided her with a female photographer role model. Were there any for you? Julia Mar yeah, I mean, I was looking at Julia Margaret Cameron and, and the way she would set things up, and it was not like what I wanted to do, but people who set up things, and I don't think that there were, I don't think any women that I was shown at the early stages, I, I don't know. Um, 
know, I'm going through my history catalog of photography right now, and I, I'm having a hard time coming up with names. I mean, well, we don't think of somebody like Arbus as setting up oh, I a picture, Arbus. but but if right. you really think about it, you know, it's a setup. Is it's yeah. not set up in in terms of placing this and this in the in the in the frame, but. Um, well, they were certainly psychologically staged yes. as well. And I loved her work. Yeah. I remember uh, Marie Cassindis' photographs, too. They were just very interesting to me. I don't know if that was something you... I know her work, but the, the it was Polaroid, not... The uh, Polaroid uh -huh. portraits, yeah. Um, thank you. Joanne, uh, I was struck by your interview in the LA Times not too long ago, and you mentioned um, the, sort of the digital juggernaut and <laughs> how overwhelming that is. And of course, having been your student 25 years ago, um, oh, it, uh, I go back in analog photography as well. And um, I mm -hmm. personally feel there's been a loss of a kind of alchemical, sensual, uh, process in this uh, technological revolution that we're in. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about that in relation to your work and to your switching to painting, and if you have any thoughts about the digital versus the analog, and what, what we might be losing, or if, if anything. <laughs> well, I get very frustrated with technical things. Uh, it doesn't come easily for me, and I really don't like it. Even with photography, I think the reason I never learned to use a camera until I had to in the class was because um, of the f-stops and the shutter speeds and all those numbers on there. So it says I don't like that part of it, but I learned what I needed to learn to make the pictures I wanted. And so with this, all this technical stuff, I just thought, Maybe I'll be dead before I have to learn this, you know? <laughs> but in fact, it didn't happen that way, and so <laughs> it's really true. So I can email, and I, you know, I know a little bit, but I cannot make my work that way. And so I would have to hire people, and that's impossible for me to do. So um, it just became difficult, and then I just wanted to get my hands in things again, and um, I had. I didn't have any photographs up, but there's some in the show. I made some clay objects and put flocking over them and photographed them in kind of faux rooms, small miniature rooms. And it just felt good to make things again. And, and I really learned how to paint, uh, at least in the way I know how to paint, recently, fairly recently, maybe 10 or 11 years ago. And so um, it was a new challenge for me. And, I just thought, God, this is so exciting to see how this works. And so that's, but I mean, they each have their place, but you know, the tide is, it's coming and it's here and it's, it, it just, it's marvelous in many ways. It makes some things much easier and it allows you to do things that you couldn't have done or wouldn't be easy to do. So, I mean, it's, it, it just is. And so. I have a question. Um, I've just been thinking. I saw um, the preview of Joanne's show that's coming up at the Craig Kroll Gallery. Um, when is it open? It's now. It's up now. But it's the, up now. Well, the opening's not till the 30th. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I went over there yesterday and saw it, and it's uh, you know it's got definitely different images in it. And would you like to talk about the difference and anything about the well? Um, I think. Show? One of the frustrations is that um, I couldn't put more things in this show. <laughs> I mean, there's never enough room, right? <laughs> and so I um, wanted to show them at Craig Kroll's, my gallery, and, um, and to show more images from some of those. Plus, I have some small paintings in there that I've done that more recently and I'm very fond of. And so um, I figured this would be a good time to do it all at the same time. So that's why. Thank you. Yes. Oh, and there's somebody up there. Uh, hello. I'm, I'm actually, if you don't mind, Joanne, That's I'm going to go back to that same era of being taught photography because I was a student of Sarkowski. Most of our t the examples of photography that we were shown were by men. There were very few women photographers that we were shown, and I think that 
this returning of the, the gaze, the woman point of view, was a quiet kind of revolution. And that artists at that time, young women, were perhaps because of what you were talking about, being a, a mother who had to support these young children, that the conceptual age of women um, defining their work is a later stage that's come about that's terribly exciting, but it didn't really exist then. It was something that women of a certain generation, their voices were really expressed in the image and less in their vocal talents to express and articulate intellectually what they were doing. I don't yeah, know if you agree thanks, with me. Thanks, Maureen. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I, it's so incredible how everything changed in the early 60s, but when I was in college, right out of high school, it, it was still thought that what you do, I mean, of course there are exceptions to this, but what you do is you go to college, you get married, you have children, and that's what you did. And then everything else was very nice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if you wanted to do that and you could have the time to do it, that's fine. But that was what your purpose was. And so, I mean, the 50s were extremely, um, Strange as you look back now, repressive, I guess is the word, and prescribed in certain ways, especially well, in the communities. Like, for so. sure, for artists, I mean, if you, you, you can't be expected to do something that's always been done or that's expected of you because that's not what artists are supposed to do. Artists are supposed to do what they need to do without any, you know. Right. Uh, wait just one second. There's been someone that I've been uh, calling on right there. Uh, the microphone is coming to you, just a second. Hi. Um, your phrase, the prolonged stare, I mean, there's definitely a challenge for that in a city like LA. In New York, it's obviously easier to, you know, people watch. Um, and so I could appreciate how you had to jump out of your car and take the photograph of that girl. And I, I just see such a distinct difference between your, your work, and I thought it was interesting that Kathy said, when are you going to do a self-portrait? Because I see so much of your work as a self-portrait um, in other words, you have such a preconceived notion and you construe elements to get the pre preconceived notion, which is really your, your self-portrait through someone else. Whereas your work, Gay, I see so much about you saying, tell me who you are. It's not, I'm going to tell you who I am through someone else. And Kathy, your work seems to be like, tell me who you are, but you have such a select group that you choose from quite often. So I see your work is also different in terms of portraiture, and I don't know if that's a correct, mm -hmm. correct in the way I've sort of seen it. I think you're Well, right. I like that comment that it is, yeah. you know, I think that's very insightful that it is a, a, a self-portrait, an extension of a self-portrait. And I think it's always so interesting how we, I think photography often uh, gets very defined within its genres and within its, you know, I ideas and, and minutia, specificity. So I think that's a really insightful, really wonderful comment. Mm -hmm. okay. I agree. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of sharing my impression and then just reflecting back to uh, something I heard you speak of. Um, and might be, you may or may not want to comment, but I was, before I walked into the exhibition, I was sort of noticing like, well, how do you decide, you know, in the banner, like who's on top and who's next? And I thought, well, if it was al alphabetical, then it would have been Joanne Callas. And <laughs> then I went in and I seemed like, well, where is her work? <laughs> when do I get to see the Joanne Callas? And it's interesting, you know, a two person show and admittedly one's dead. And so, you know, his work is completed, but you know, um, and I'm sure there's always lots of work when one wants to have saved, but you know, I'm wondering, like, it's terrific that this is happening and that you're there and all this, but I actually had a sense of, I didn't necessarily expect parity, per se. I wasn't looking inch by inch, but it didn't seem, um, it seemed a little, uh, and I'm wonder. I totally am appreciative of what I what what was provided, but it it felt like very different. Uh, both the work is different, but also a very different intention in the presentation of his work in kind of a the retrospective encyclopedic mode, and yours where we got um, sort of, um, you know, it was more focused. Um, and I just would love to hear any of you that might want to illuminate on that, if you if you're willing to do so in the halls in which it happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, first of all, I'm 
extremely grateful for that I had this opportunity and to tell you I had the time of my life it was so much fun and I thank everybody at the Getty for making that possible and um, it was always it was presented to me that Paul Otterbridge is the main show and that I will be showing with him and that my show is not going to be a retrospective um, it was going to be a smaller show and was I still interested and I certainly was and um, Yes, I mean, I wish I had more space, but I'm s terrifically happy with what's there. And, uh, and besides, you know, uh, I'm not dead yet. It's, uh, having a show with uh, <clears throat> Otter Bridge as the opening act is really, she did, uh, it looks really good. It does. <laughs> it was. I mean, he was an influence of mine, actually. I got into color after seeing his work, so it was a perfect. Uh, I could I could see how color could be used in an emotional sort of way and so after seeing his work because before that it was more um, about color was Eggleston you know out there and then uh, so this was a way that I saw oh you can do what I like to do and it can be color so that was an influence yeah Hi. Um, I was particularly uh, enthralled with the, the uh, uh, black and white photos of a woman in, in, with water, mm -hmm. uh, older ones. Uh, could you talk about them? I'm, I'm interested in actually how you physically did them and what they mean to you. Well, um, sometimes uh, they were done with, it's a single negative, it's just reflection in water. That's all there is to it. So no manipulation that way. All the manipulation is before the shutter goes off. And, and I was thinking about how certain gestures can look similar to other gestures that are completely opposite from those. So if you think of um, dreaming and sleeping, you know, they'd look the same. Or death and sleeping could look the same. And so I was just exploring that and just some visual things that happen. Water creates the fabric to float, and it creates different kinds of shapes, and it, it's, it's kind of a never-never world, and, and beautiful and scary, and yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I'm really glad you asked that question, because I think that's a, that there's a whole lot in there. That's, a, that's an important um, aspect of your work. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing that up then. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. Um, as a student photographer, um, we're always looking for inspiration and ideas and new theories and concepts. And uh, I have a question for the images of the women's backs. What was the idea, that, um, the inspiration that, I know that you were trying to expose portrait without face and emotion, body language, but what was the true inspiration for that series that you did? I'll just say mine and then Kathy can do hers, but for me it was that feeling, like what would it feel like to take a, a pencil down the back like that, or something dripping down the back, and woman with wet hair has, the wet hair is dripping down the back, and it's, it's just like it gives you the chills, and so there's that tactile quality that it's just that way, it's, it's kind of great, I think, to have that feeling, you know. It tickles and it feels great at the same time. <laughs> and then when we look at it, we can imagine what it yes, feels like. Yeah, exactly. My self-portrait, really, you did feel that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite a bit. Exactly. Um, you know, I really wanted, I think that it, one of the things about self-portraiture or thinking about that definition again is that one often thinks about the recognition of the artist in relationship to ideas of self-portrait. And so for me, I really wanted to make something that was uh, really in relationship to ideas of identity that was very much about myself. And so therefore it was, you know, constructed in that way of, you know, the two stick figure girls and what we draw as children in kindergarten, that it's usually the stick figure dad and mom 
and how these languages get collapsed on top of one another and the back being physically turned from the uh, viewer, but at the same time, all the desire still loaded onto that. So that's kind of what I was thinking in relationship to making that image. So we've got time for one last question. There's a person here in a white sweater um, on this side. First, I guess. Oh, I don't oh. know. Okay, well, Hang on, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm so, I feel like the three of you and being here, and I think there's something so revolutionary at this moment, especially when we started talking about the difference between the way women's history um, is looked at within art history and especially within photography and the way that um, history up to this point within art history uh, still comes from a very, um, I don't want to say male, but I want to say a male ruling point of view. I mean, women do it too. And I was so moved when the three of you were touching on um, what I felt was being said was what kind of different uh, history are we creating at this moment. I felt like it was so out of the box. And I'm so thrilled that we can talk about passion, Joanne, <laughs> and that we can talk about um, what our passions are in the work and where they honestly come from. And I think we're talking about a different way of documenting work and a different kind of art history. Uh, I don't want to say men or women because that's just way too at, you know, inside the box. But I want to say that I think just this event um, and the way that Biography comes in, of course, to everybody's work, but it doesn't um, predetermine how a woman makes work. And I think the three of you up there demonstrate the incredible dynamics of personal pleasure and incredible inquisitiveness into the lives of others that come from oneself. And um, when we talk about male biography within art history, it's, you know, like, I, we don't need all those details. Um, and it's very determined. How we talk about women's work in terms of art history is really at an exciting place. And I think that the three of you are demonstrating that it can be very textured, we can talk about pleasure, and there is no groove that you're going to get caught into. And I hope that that is a way that we can continue thinking about the human and the way that you've really demonstrated that so beautifully. Thank you. There's one person that's most important that I haven't thanked, and that's my husband, David Pan, for all his support over many, many years. <laughs> Yay. Yay. <laughs> it's so true. We talk about making work and collaborate together, and, and he's such a talented, amazing person with a great imagination, and so he's, he's just always been there for me, except for a short period of time, but other than that. <laughs> We're not mentioning that. <laughs> See, that's the part. See, you that's don't the part about just saying more than you're supposed to. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to be really honest, but it's just been a great, a great influence for me. A very that's meaningful. That's true. And that was a wonderful comment. Thank you very much. Yes. But it seemed to me there was one other person who had the microphone. Did you, in the white sweater, there's the microphone right to your left. Behind. I don't really have a question, oh, but there was one thing in, um, in seeing this that. I appreciate that didn't really come out very much. And it's from me, but in its relationship mostly at the moment to Joanne's work. 
I think there's an underlying sexuality and sexual tension that hasn't really been discussed. And what I like about Joanne's work is that you, are, you react to it. And for me, that sexual tension has always been there, and I've known her work for a long time. But I didn't hear it talked about. And when she works, it gets right there. The way she works and the way it's received is instant, prolonged, but always a little bit questioned, which did come up. But I just wondered why no one had mentioned, or maybe it's just me, but it's, you the said it beautifully. <laughs> no. Would you would you like to address that? No. No. <laughs> 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 I just like to allude to those things without being graphic. So. Well, you sort of said it when yeah. the desserts yeah. were up there. She said something, but uh, sort of uh, under her breath like that. I mean, it, <laughs> it wasn't quite, it's, you know. They're humorous and obvious and... Um, <laughs> Thank you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it more fun. <laughs> okay, should we call it a night? Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.